is a problem slash challenge here, you know, about how do we incentivize people to actually come together, as you say, and may, it might be that, you know, one of them is so much better than the others that they should just, you know, that, that some of the projects should give up. Um, or that they all need to come together and, you know, kind of figure out how to, how to, how to work together. And I don't, I think that, you know, those incentives are probably very different across these different spaces. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the challenges that I've been working on as well is, you know, how can we create a room for all three of those people and have a seat at the table for all three of those people? And I think what I've kind of come up with from my perspective is that it really makes sense to, separate the data and have a transactional network for the data separate from the features and the access and the user engagement and all of the other social community driven features. So if we can move towards just a transactional infrastructure that is kind of like a visa credit card only free that could just manage the transactions, manage the licensing behind the scenes and so that people can build the social value in their community and still distribute it, right? I think that that's what they're looking for. And I don't think they really care about if the data goes through their transactional engine or if everybody has it, or, if, you know, I think we get caught too much in ownership of the data. But Yeah, I mean, there are, I think, you know, like one of the things that happens in our space is that there are sort of philosophical differences between the different repositories, right? You know, where, for example, some of them are much more sort of standards focused than others. And that's, you know, and that, that might be an argument to actually have multiple repositories, right? If you want to, if you want to go to the wild west and not worry about data standards, you go to the wild west one. If you want to worry about standards, you come to ours. Um, but I think there, you know, I, I, um, I, I agree with you that it would be nice to have that kind of like, you know, global infrastructure, but I think that there are some, some, and maybe those are just social challenges around, you know, getting everybody to buy into standards, but there are some challenges around, you know, kind of um, around doing that. I was just gonna um, chime in. I'm Julie Lowndes. I'm at UC Santa Barbara at NCs and OpenScapes. Um, but I, when we talk about incentives around open science, I think um, I often hear a lot of focus on the products, like the publishing and the data, which is a huge part of the current structure of science and the current incentivizing of science. But I think there's like a day-to-day -day process of science that we can also incentivize through open science because in my experience, you know, the open source world has been so much more friendly and innovative and welcoming and inclusive than I had experienced in science per se. And that has been a huge part of me wanting to like um, continue that in science and elevate that in science. So, that, because, you know, especially, you know, for, for many researchers, especially earlier career folks that, you know, were interested in thinking of different avenues for them to participate in science, publishing is pretty rare in their life and sharing data is pretty rare in their life. But what is daily in their life is like trying to collaborate with data, trying to communicate around their research and all that stuff. And I think the, I think there's a lot of incentive to just make that daily process of science better. And I think open source has a big part of that. So yeah, I no, I, I think that's that. a great point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Go ahead, Tim. Um, one thing I guess I wanted to throw out there, I don't think there's anything that can be done about it necessarily, but it often, often I, it seems when, when talking about finding funding and sustainability and so on, the often finding that match with a, a funder depends so much on who is there. So, um, we were talking to a particular funder and then the person we wanted to talk to left that organization and that funder just then fell off the, off the page as a, a potential source of money. And it's, I recognize that it's very much a person to person interaction, but it, it seems very arbitrary in some ways that no matter how good your idea is, it very much, whether or not it's successful depends on whether you find the right person to talk to. Yeah, that's definitely been my experience. Back would, to the, yeah. Sorry, go on. I was just going to say that I was going to make that same kind of comment that it feels arbitrary. It's like a beauty contest. 
you know, and, and, and it's a lot of it is who you know, and if you're just coming into Sean's point, if you're just coming into the space and you don't have a big network, you are completely disadvantaged, you know? And so it, it's, that is one of the reasons, again, that we started IOI was to try to create a slightly more level playing field where possible um, and to enlist more than just sort of the usual funding suspects, but to look at how institutional collective funding could work, but also government agency funding more targeted towards open and things like that. Because right now it's, it's, it really is very, very arbitrary and completely unfair in my opinion. Definitely. And I think, you know, with regard to these, you know, these ideas about collaboration, the, all of the, again, you know, speaking from somebody who, you know, gets NIH and NSF grants, the, the mechanisms, you know, by which those grants are funded are all, they, they, they put so much friction in the way of collaboration, right? They're all built around like the one person getting a big pot of money and going and doing something model. And, you know, there's both financial and administrative challenges if you want to have a bunch of people involved. Um, in doing something. So I think there's, there's certainly room for, you know, for kind of that policy advocacy around changing the way that, um, that those things happen at federal agencies. I don't, I don't know, you know, what it looks like at foundations. I, my guess is it's, it's probably a little more flexible, but So since we're speaking about funders, I'll kind of pull in an analogy that I've been hearing a lot from a group at NIH that's involved in talking with the generalist repository community, which is this idea of co-opetition. So having there be competition between repositories, whether they're discipline specific and then can apply really specific standards like open neuro, or if it's more of a generalist repository or even something in the middle, you know, like a thematic repository, right? Um, and at each of those levels, um, trying to figure out what the standards are that are sort of below the line is the analogy that keeps being used. This comes from a workshop that was back in February. Sorry, what, is that, what does that mean? Yeah, below the line. What are those standards that we should all do the same, like stop reinventing the wheel, support that infrastructure, yeah. and then let people do things above the line that are custom, that are either method specific or repository specific, or right. you know, have some sort of human you know, service level component to it or something with reproducing yeah. the data or something like that. It's interesting. Uh, I, I, I am, I'm involved in this group that we call in mind. I can't even remember what the, the acronym stands for. Um, but basically it's a group of five or six labs, all of whom develop software for uh, fMRI data analysis. And, you know, we've, it turned out that each of us was developing like workflows for this particular kind of analysis in parallel, you know, like putting a ton of work into like totally, you know, kind of overlapping efforts. And, um, and we all basically decided, hey, let's come together and figure out like what, even though, you know, in the end, there's going to be different things that we want to do. How, you know, how can we sort of to the greatest degree possible share, right? Mm -hmm. Share to the degree that there's components that we can all kind of take and use. Can we do that? And, and what that's driven us to now do is sort of think through, you know, what, what are the, for example, you know, we need a set of coding standards, right? That every group, if, if you know, different groups are going to be developing code, they need to follow the same standards that follow the same testing strategies, um, you know, all these sorts of things. And it's been, it's been a really interesting discussion that's been ongoing for, I think, six, eight months now um, about, you know, what it takes for a, a, a set of, of people to try to come together. And it, it almost, you um, you know, it almost fits with this kind of co-opetition sort of idea, because ultimately, you know, we do all have to go get academic credit for our little specific things, but to the degree that we're sharing stuff, you know, um, under the hood and kind of saving uh, overlapping efforts, we're hopeful that that's going to be effective. We'll see where it goes. Sounds interesting and similar. Yeah. One of the sort of components that uh, Anna's comment made me think of was something like ORCID, where there's, we can all agree, okay, maybe let's build our, our things on ORCID because that's going to be a shared standard. We're going to lock down the identity aspect of things and then um, ROR or these other, these other shared standards in that degree um, so that we're all 
talking about the same people and looking at the same things. Um, and then yeah, maybe- that's Permanent identifiers is definitely something that's below the line. <laughs> Don't make your own. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I guess the question comes um, up, you know, data standards is something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about and working on, but that's a, that's, it's, it's, you know, certainly I think it should be below the line, but there's a lot of people who would argue, in, at least in our field. I mean, you know, scientists generally don't like to be told what to do, right? Um, and well, so, there's, so there's a lot of people who bristle at, you know, someone coming along and saying, you have to organize your data in this particular way. They, you know, partly because it's extra work for them if they had a different way of organizing, but also it's just, you know, it's, uh, people you know, it's like this not admitted here idea of like people thinking that, you know, their way is of course the best way. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of interesting things that are kind of right at the surface there that could pop between being above or below that line. It's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> one of the things that I think should be above the line actually is IDs. And I know that's going to be controversial and I know a lot of people are going to want to stay with the standard uh, access and identity management and, and other tools. There's big open source ones like uh, Forge Rock, I believe, and, and those uh, and Orchid ID. I'm not sure what they're built on. But the reason why I say that is because there's a whole bunch of new new architectural design models that are coming out in, in the blockchain technology and, and multi-ledger, just dis fully distributed ledger, partially distributed ledgers, and, and things that allow for much more flexibility in, in business networks. So the one tool that I've been using is Corda, and it's getting huge amounts of tractions and hundreds of millions of dollars investments from the financial industry for international money settlements, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think it has a great uh, capability to provide eventually what we so need, in my opinion, in, in science, which is provenance and provenance through a, a ledger chain, but the one that respects privacy and one where everybody is known and their entities are, are unique and identifiable. Right. And I think as soon as you move over to that new disruptive infrastructure, then a whole bunch of dynamics change, right? A whole bunch of the business models change because now you have this modular infrastructure where you can go in and you can have a new notarization service. You can have a new Oracle business service. You can compete in this in this global arena by having pluggable modules in for different organizations. Right. And you can have different business networks and you can have different groups and you can have offer different services and, you know, but you're all using one infrastructure and one global identity in that sense. And you can even have separate quarter nodes and there's some integration between between those networks. Right. So, you know, I, I understand the desire to leave those below the line items alone. But I just feel as though that there's some incredible innovation happening right now in IT infrastructure that could really be valuable and could really be a game changer going forward. Um, you know, Russ, you mentioned um, NSF grants that have been really pushing for collaboration. And one of the projects I've been working with over the last year and a half um, at Stratos is a new funder called Aligning Science Across Parkinson's ASAP. Mm -hmm. And this funder um, is, is absolutely sort of pushing for collaboration as well as open science. And the open science is in order to facilitate the collaboration, you know? So you can't collaborate if you're not actually sharing items together. Yeah. And so we, the, the, fund, the grants they've just given out this fall um, to 21 teams, $160 million is um, these, these teams are required as part of the conditions of the grant to share everything, data sets, code, protocols, any lab resources that they've used, all with persistent identifiers, all publicly at the time of a mandatory preprint. And the mm -hmm. mandatory preprint must come at, at the time or before you're submitting to a journal. Wow, that's so, cool. Yeah, it's, it's pushing, it's really pushing the envelope. And it's interesting because I'm helping to build the infrastructure, all open source, of course, to support mm -hmm. this. And a lot of other funders are kind of like, well, that's interesting. And so we're actually building a research output management system that could be used by others. That is you know, an open source way to actually collect and manage and make visible all of these different research outputs all along the way. So that at the very beginning, when they're using, creating a data set and they're, you know, the, the, this tool encourages them to use that, put that on a, the appropriate data repository and keep it, you know, keep it closed initially if they want to, but then begin to share it either within this network or publicly at a later stage with the acknowledgement they must do at the time of this mandatory preprint. 
And it's amazing how little resistance we're getting from people once you say to them, this is the condition of your grant, and these aren't small grants, Yep. Here are the tools we're giving you to do this. We will help facilitate it. And ASAP is actually funding a full-time project manager for each team to help make those things happen. Hmm. So human, you know, not human infrastructure, human beings to work with the tools to make it happen is part of the whole plan as well. And I think it's, it's a different approach that um, I feel where the funders have the carrots and the sticks, this is a way to actually maybe use them in a more useful way and hopefully creative create open infrastructure that's reusable by others and becomes closer to a kind of best practice, if not a standard. No, that sounds very cool. It does. And it just brings me back to the fact that funders have the money. And so we're talking about sustainability, you know, and I think that, you know, I keep looking to funders who seemingly want to have more and more, you know, stronger policies um, and are pushing, you know, the coalition S group and things like that, sort of like, okay, what are you going to do about that? How are you going to, you know, put up the funds that are needed to make these things work? I think on, also on Anna's core petition point, or maybe what Sean was saying too, is that there's, it's all sort of the, there's a lot of ortho, orthogonality in that if there is one group or three or four groups striving to create a, in parallel, a piece of infrastructure, others who want to use that infrastructure will probably end up picking the winner and then that becomes below the line standard. Yeah. And then we all move on uh, with one of those particular, I mean, sort of in the way that there was a lot of versions of researcher IDs and we've all now landed on ORCID. Yeah, I mean, in the context of data repositories too and PIs being responsible or or wanting to start them for a specific discipline or, or, or topic or methodology or something, um, they often don't have either the expertise or the team or the bandwidth to do all of the infrastructure that's required for a repository, right? So in a certain sense, the funder giving them the money, you know, they really, they need a partner. And so rather than continuing to build that infrastructure from scratch, that's kind of thing we're trying to do is partner with people to say like, we'll be the backbones and then you can customize it and, you know, be still be the person who gets credit, but you at least didn't have to worry about the the infrastructure, the you know the security, the accessibility, the preservation, um, those below the line things. So that's a bit of a partnership there between the infrastructure and the PIs. Yeah, we had in building um, Open Neuro, we actually started out working with another group, um, a, a high performance computing group who was building you know sort of. Um, uh, what do they call them? Um, like kind of science as a service platforms, um, which is ultimately what we wanted Open Neuro to turn into. Um, and with the, you know, we, we always walked up to these things with the idea that if somebody else is building the thing, we don't want to go like, you know, uh, build it ourselves, right? The problem is that, you know, it took us a year to figure out that well, the stuff that they said they could do, they couldn't do very well. And there were enough like little things that basically we finally just threw it all away and rebuilt it from scratch after spending a bunch of time trying to kind of shoehorn ourselves into a, an existing project. And I know other people have had, you know, exactly that same kind of experience. So it's, it's, uh, um, yeah, I, I think it, you know, in part it comes down to like, you know, the fact that we, we had very particular things we wanted to do, right? Um, and yeah, I'm sure, yeah, once you have very specific things, it gets harder. And, and if you yep. weren't partners building things from the beginning, then. Yeah. Yep. Well, and so, that's one of the beauties of open source technology, right? Especially if it's copy lefted. Yeah. Um, and I think there's some confusion around uh, open versus copy lefting, right? In the, in the IT world, when you're dealing with software licenses, you get the GPL licenses and things that require all future iterations to also be uh, copy freely available and creative commons doesn't necessarily have those restrictions right mm -hmm. so when we talk about open i think there's some ambiguity there whether we're really talking about copy lefting which is everything for perpetuity and anything you build on it has to be open sourced versus you know um, open freely visible you know open. some of us call that viral <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, you know, for us, it's, a, it's, you know, we're in academia, we're still fighting the battle to get people to even like care about putting a license on things, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there's, there's lots of, uh, it, even in the IT software world, there's lots of tools coming out now, which help you to manage the proliferation of licenses that your software has. You could be using packages with five different kinds of licenses on there and you want to build a, a production product. And how do you know what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do? How do you merge those licenses? How do you agree on those contracts and, yep. and with those people, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, that's the other thing that I think that a, a contract management type of transactional system in the back end can help with is because you will have to, at some point, work at managing these different licenses. And if they're in digital contracts, then that almost makes it easier to do that. Right. Um, so we have, I think we have like five minutes before they um, kick us back to the main room. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, like what, what, this has been good to have this discussion. Does it go anywhere beyond this breakout room? And what, you know, what would be the vehicles for that? Um, what, you know, what might we do beyond this to, to try to address these challenges? I'm interested to hear thoughts. I mean, other than well, I'm know, I'm planning on spending sorry. three months building stuff, so <laughs> we'll see where I am in March. Right. Obviously, we'll come back to J. Ross next time it has, uh, next time it is held, um, and you know, and hopefully see each other in person and discuss the stuff. But um, well, you know, I do think you know what came out of the last J. Ross, and it was during the sustainability session that I remember I was in. Um, was IOI and and the goal really was to try to work on this and now we have a, an organization set up um, that is now the host of this conference and I think so I think that we should think of that as the J Rost conversation in between J Rost meetings mm -hmm. where hopefully and now we have a new Zoom set up for IOI we can continue these conversations because you know I think there is an appetite for concrete action but the challenge is figuring out what that action needs to be. And like I said, there are people doing different things. You know, there are different models emerging um, that probably that people are experimenting with. And the trends that I see are towards more collective funding, but also funding, not just individual projects for brief periods of time, but funding more like of a set of like a tool chain that has a certain that's that meets the needs of a group or community or that creates a solution that's competitive with a commercial one because it's and it's an open one or um uh funding for collaboration integration and things like that so i, I you know it's interesting to see if that that kind of those kinds of trends continue You know, one of the things I'd love to see out of the community eventually is kind of a, a very high level map, just an, an idea of the constituency that were the stakeholders that we're looking at, where everybody kind of uh, resides in their world, whether they be a library, a, a tool builder, you know, a technology department. I'd love to see a high level map and to get to know, just to be able to come down at a glance and see the community and all its diversity a little bit easier. The suggestion I was going to throw in would be addresses what I mentioned right at the beginning is how how much of this is is personal building personal relationships with funders, which everyone else is trying to do. So perhaps one function that IOI or JROS could do would be some sort of speed dating between people with money who want to support projects and people with ideas that need support. Um, so that they could get quickly to alignment. I need this. I'm going to make this, and 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 then have that maybe be the source of like short and sweet grants so that people can prove out ideas, and then and then and then bigger money could follow if need be down the line. Right, where the the bigger money following is the is the real challenge, right? Because I think right now it's, you know, one can get money 
for kind of, you know, upfront investment in a new project, or at least it's relatively easier to get that than it is to get sustained funding for maintenance and. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the funder sessions at Jay Rost have been, have been really interesting to hear their perspective on what they want to fund and what they see the future being. And it may be that there is shared infrastructure that can be funded. That's consortiums or partnerships um, across different people in the community. And that would be really helpful to move things forward in terms of sustainability. Um, and then the funders perhaps commit to, to funding that sustainably, um, even in the long run, because there are always um, costs going forward. And I mean, I think we're kind of seeing a shift with that at NIH, right? Like some institutes are moving away from funding data repositories with R01s to mm -hmm. other mechanisms. and. Yeah have to kind of wait and see how those develop, um, but supporting the broader open infrastructure community does seem to be something that's on the radar of, of certainly the funders we heard from here and, and, and large federal funders as well. So yeah. Yeah. having conversations with them. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, um, this uh, this is it's been great to connect with all of you and you know and get your thoughts on this. So um, so hopefully you know we'll be able to stay in touch through the you know through this the the community and see each other you know when the meeting comes around again in a, a couple of years I guess. Um, and feel free to you know if any of you have particular points you want to raise or thoughts you have or any suggestions. Um, either you know add them into this document because this is going to be you know part of the record, or um, feel free to get in touch with me by email or by the um, by the Slack. Um, and uh, and yeah, thanks again for for being part of this. It's been really fun. Um, okay, thanks everyone. And I think if you go back to the main room, we're about ready for the awards ceremony. So join for that. Thank you very much uh, for your patience and listening to me out here. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.